Good afternoon to all of you in the United States and good evening to our speakers and guests in Europe. Um, it is my great honor to welcome you to the online discussion entitled Echoes of European Documentary Film. Uh, we stream live from New York City. I'm the Deputy Council General of the Czech Republic in New York. Um, today's discussion is part of the Ecos of the Jihlava International Documentary Film Festival in New York, an event that has taken place here uh, in the past four years. Uh, this year, we only meet virtually, which makes the Ecos of Jihlava to be streamed online for the first time. Um, adding a positive note to that, the streaming makes the event available to even larger audience across the United States, which is fantastic. Um, I would like to thank to all who made the event possible, especially to um, Jihlava International Documentary Film Festival, the largest event of its kind in Central Europe, uh, to the uh, platform Da Films, to our colleagues from the Austrian, Portuguese, French, um, uh, and French culture institutions, uh, Trebich Whiskey and uh, Czech Tourism. Um, special thanks goes also to our colleagues uh, from the Czech Center in New York. Also, just for the simple fact that they did not give up on organizing so many interesting events, uh, despite the limitations caused by the pandemic, including this one. Uh, this year, the Ecos of Jihlava in New York has presented three interesting European films from the Czech Republic, uh, Portugal, Austria, and uh, France. And I'm very honored to welcome you to this closing event, which is the debate with excellent filmmakers who will discuss their films featured in the festival with a special focus on American context and on how um, European documentaries are currently being received in the United States. Um, it is symbolic that the discussion is moderated from Los Angeles, uh, which uh, brings me to introduce the moderator of the discussion and I'm very, very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Summer Garber, um, a documentary filmmaker and film festival programmer based in LA. Um, she was the director of operations at Slamdance uh, and she has been the co-captain of the documentary programming committee since 2013. Uh, she was also the senior programmer uh, for the Bentonville Film Festival in addition to screening and consulting for a number of other festivals, including uh, AFI and LAFA. Uh, allow me to uh, give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so my name is Summer. I live in Los Angeles. I'm a longtime documentary film programmer and maker. Um, I've lived in California my whole life. I have traveled to Prague and loved it, but my pronunciation is going to be terrible. So I want to just start off with that from the top so I don't offend anyone. Um, and then let's go around in a circle. And um, if we can start with Adam and say your name and the film that you're with and maybe where you're located, because I think it's cool that we're kind of all over the, the globe right now. Hello. So I can say a few words about uh, me and uh, the film. So I'm Adam Molha. Uh, I'm from Slovakia. I live in Czech Republic, based in Prague. Uh, studied the film school there. And uh, we've uh, made the film Alchemical Furnace together with Jan Daniel, who cannot uh, join us for this discussion, but he says hi. He doesn't speak so much fluent English, so he rather took this uh, decision for me. So. Uh, I'm here to to answer your questions, and I will be really glad to to hear something from the from the audience, which is maybe a little bit too much far away from me, but I hope that uh, it's still present. So I'm here to to answer your questions. I will be glad. Perfect, um, Pedro. You want to go next? Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you to the Czech Center in New York and to everyone who put the program together. I'm a film producer mostly. Uh, I do many things in films, but uh, I've been producing most of the time now. 
Um, I'm in Lisbon. Uh, I opened a company several, several years ago. Uh, I have this film, The Ghosts, Long Way Home, uh, in the program, directed by Tiago Siopa, who is a, it's a newcomer. It's a new filmmaker who has done some things in the past, but we can say this is his debut uh, film, feature length film, documentary film. And it's, well, we can talk a bit more about it later, but it's a very particular uh, production process that gave origin to a very peculiar film, I think. Um, I've also produced The Metamorphosis of Birds, which is a film that was in the Berlinale last year. It's been sold a bit everywhere uh, in this past uh, 12 months during the pandemic. So that's also maybe an interesting case study for us. Um, and well, I'll be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Great. Um, Hubert, you want to go next? Um, hi, I'm Hubert Sauber. I'm, I'm glad to be with you guys. Um, I am based in Paris. <clears throat> I was born in Austria. I lived in France for the last 30 years, I think, or 28, maybe. <clears throat> and, uh, I, I work uh, most mostly on documentaries in what is referred to the southern uh, yeah, the southern hemisphere, I would say. Um, my most known film is called Darwin's Nightmare, um, which uh, which was quite known in, in the states and in, uh, in, in the world. And uh, my latest film is about the states. It's a uh, it's called Epicentro. It's the film that's in the program now. It is about the, the narrative and the self-representation uh, of uh, the United States as, a, as an empire. Um, it's kind of the non, uh, non avoué I don't know how you say it in English, uh, non-admitted part of the United States uh, uh, or hard or diffi with difficulty admitted that the United States is, is an empire. And uh, the, uh, the fact is that the, the U.S. as an empire started in, in one night uh, in 1898 with one big bang uh, uh, in the harbor of Havana, Cuba. And that's where the film is based. That's why I have Cuban folklore in my apartment in Paris behind me. So it's called, this is Epicenter. And I think uh, <clears throat> uh, if, I'm, if I'm right, the people are just watching the film last, now or the films now. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's correct. Uh, They're uh, available till midnight tonight, I believe, New York. And I'm happy to be with you guys. It's uh, looks it looks great. It's a beautiful film. We're happy to have you here. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy you guys brought in some of your past experiences too, because um, we're basically for this conversation placing these films in a U.S. context since they're playing out of New York. Um, so I wanted each of you to take turns, and maybe we can go in the same order we just went talking a little bit about your US experience with these films or past films in terms of audience reception, festival experience you've had, distribution, otherwise. And perhaps if this film hasn't had a huge US reception or response, maybe why you chose to focus on a different audience, maybe something more local to what your story is. Um, just generally your experience so far with this film in the US. Um, and Adam, you can go ahead and start. Okay. So uh, my experience with the U.S. Um, festivals is very, uh, how to say, I've been, I've been presenting my previous film in uh, Toronto Hot Dogs Film Festival. It was taking place in 2013, I would say, yes. And it, it was very pleasant. Uh, I found it a little bit different from European festivals in sense of uh, like maybe bigger audience, uh, uh, more films. Uh, and also I met a lot of people from Europe who actually became my, my friends since then. So it's good to connect through US space into, <laughs> into your own home uh, friends. So this was, this was good. And I would just like say one little story from that. Um, uh, when I was playing my first movie, which is called New Life of Family Album uh, in Toronto, I was quite depressed because they were showing it in, a, in the big cinema, like a, like a huge hall, like the biggest screen ever I ever experienced in my life. And uh, there were 60 people in the screening. So 
I found it a little bit uh, embarrassing. Uh, I went depressed out of the cinema, walking the streets of Toronto. And uh, there was another screening, another day, which I attended and it was quite the same. Uh, there were maybe like 100 people in this big uh, hall. And after the film, some of the uh, guys came, they were around 60. And I said, ah, in, in this film is your grandma. This grandma was teaching me in the primary school in Miava, which was the city of my my mama's birth, my, my mama's birthplace. So the expats who've been living in Toronto for such years were like uh, coming to me after the screening and saying me such a personal message that uh, it turned my U.S. Uh, appearance uh, as one of the best day of my life uh, until the moment. So. I just realized that miracles are, are happening and even you are doing a little thing, sometimes it can meet with a great audience. And I would say that documentaries in the US are also made differently and they, they are like following different paths. But it was, for me, it was great experience. And with this film, Alchemical Furnace, uh, it's actually, I think, our US premiere just right now. So hard to say. I think the times that we are watching film online uh, brings us to the new situation that uh, allows us to percept films different way. And I, I'm not judging if it's good or, or bad, but uh, let's wait for the results. I mean, the films are made for for as much audience as as it can approach and i think it's just a matter of time that it will turn out that we need to share it uh, this way how we are doing it now so without the cinema of course we would like to screen the film in the in the in the big screen but I'm starting to think that this is the also the possibility how to approach people who are interested. So I'm happy. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and I want to get more into that too in another question, like when, with the evolving state of online film festivals and all of that. Um, definitely some pros and cons. But it's so funny what a small world it is in your um, hot dog story. Pedro, you want to go next? Um, has this film played in the US or what's your experience um, in the past with US reception? Sure, well, this film is also having its uh, US premiere in this broker. I think this is also a consequence of, well, the pandemic and all the, the COVID situation. Uh, otherwise, maybe it would have been different. But well, in the past, films I've produced have been in, well, if we think about festivals, they've been, Art of the Real in New York or uh, True False, other, other events. Uh, but I'm really interested in, in thinking about how we could make these films, we, not which films we could make because we should make the films we want, but how could we take them to, without having to change the films we do, how can we take, make them be seen by my, by people in other places and well throughout the US for instance uh, and I really think it would be possible uh, I, I come from a background where well people in my family were not watching like the avant-garde films that were coming out at the time and I, 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 ha I was lucky and I started watching them the way I could but this to say that I believe many people would like to, to watch them, but they, they can't, sadly, because maybe they're not pr well promoted uh, enough, maybe because there's not this part of the, the chain that takes the films to the people. It's not working the way it could be working. Um, this, this other film I produced, uh, The Metamorphosis of Birds, uh, we, we had similar stories like to the ones Adam just told, to the one Adam just told. Um, with the pandemic, so many screenings have been online that people in kind of remote places have seen the film and otherwise maybe they, they would not because the, there's not a big festival where they live. And it's been really funny because I, I love the big theater, 
the big screen and all the, the experiences. And, and not only, it's not a, a matter of size, it's also like to be with other people. For me, that's actually even more important. Uh, I think for everyone probably. But it's also been funny how the, the virtual uh, screen, the computer screen cinema uh, experience with the pandemic especially has made some people access the films and they would not otherwise. Um, I was talking to people in, well, from several festivals, in, including in the US and now they can track the, where people are geographically. And uh, people are in remote areas sometimes and we, we kind of forget where, that people are not only in New York or in Los Angeles or the big cities. So, well, well I, I'm kind of uh, optimistic. I hope I'm not being naive, but I, I think I can see some good things that we could do in the future from now on. But well, overall, I can't say really the films I've produced and worked at have really been uh, distributed uh, in any significant way in the US. And I, I would love that to happen. So maybe with well, the four of us, we could uh, invent some things, some paths to, to do that. Um, well, I don't know if and this I answered your- is, is going a long way towards that too. There, I definitely agree that there's a, a greater need for access in the US to independent Euro European cinema um, than there is the actual infrastructure for that access. So um, I do think that's improving now with virtual film festivals. So I definitely think that that's been a trend in the right direction. Um, Hubert, do you wanna talk about your experience um, in the US? Have you, with this film or any previous films, um, advice for other filmmakers or American nice. audiences reaching some of these films, anything like that? Uh, I, I don't think I have advice for anyone. I don't even know what to do myself. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk uh, a little bit about that experience? Um, well, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I think I'm luckier than, than our friend that just uh, talked. Um, I, I have, all of my films have US distribution. All of them are, have cinema distribution, all of them, uh, running for the Oscars um, and one was shortlisted and one was nominated for an Oscar but I'm still kind of a, a freak in, in the in the world of documentary um, in, in the US context I'm kind of I, I don't know how it happened that Darwin's Nightmare got nominated for an Oscar it's just so off the chart to anything that was running against or, or, or at the same time so the March of the Penguins won the Oscar that 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 year. Um, just to give you a, <clears throat> I don't know if you if you know this film is like Penguins who speak. Yeah, no, I know the, taste, the typical taste of the Oscars. So of course, gun running, uh, Ukrainian mafiosi in Central Africa with fish bones uh, being eaten by local populations. Uh, that's the antithesis of of. Uh, <laughs> of penguins who are nice and, and, and monogamous and talk. Um, so um, so uh, in a way, <clears throat> it's, almost, it, it's almost a miracle how this happened, you know, and, uh, and I have like my, my kind of my niche. I mean, I, I, <clears throat> it's kind of, despite myself, I, I developed a, uh, a style, you know, the critics are writing about uh, how is the style work what the style really is that I, 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 I work with such a minimalist, uh, in such a minimalist way in, in, a, in, a, in a logistical and technical sense um, that I literally, you know, run around with tiny cameras with uh, lit by a candle sometimes in, in, the, in the middle of the Congo. And that's a scene in the middle of the night. Um, you cannot reduce, you know, making cinema more than that. No, it's like one person, one candle, and one little tiny camera, um, and another person being filmed. Um, but I also make a, a huge effort in, in research, years on end. Uh, I have sometimes a big team <clears throat> to prepare things, to to find 
people on the other side of the world. So, so and the outcome is 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 a uh, very clearly for the American viewer of you know European art house cinema, and <clears throat> and so what's your question is what is the audience? I I, I think. Um, you know, it's a dialectic between us filmmakers and the film readers or, or the, the audience um, of what kind of narrative uh, is, or what kind of cinematic language is is being uh, conveyed and how far can you push the, the boundaries of, of kind of experimenting with narrative and form that it is still kind of received and perceived and, and felt and experienced as, 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 as real cinema. Uh, and at what point do you lose people? Because I mean, uh, <clears throat> once, uh, once the films that we, I guess everyone in this, in this room here, uh, virtual room, uh, we, we make movies that are, are hitting a nail with, uh, with uh, art house uh, uh, cinema goers and then people can start cry and, and feel a life-changing experience and millions of other people would go like, what kind of movie is this? You know, what, that's not a movie. There is, it's, what's, who's the bad guy? Who's the good guy? I was like, what's, what's going on here? You know? So, so that, that is, that is the fact when, when, a, when a little documentary, like, like in this case, Darwin's Nightmare, gets out of its, 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 uh, you know, family where it's <laughs> was meant to be received. And it's being seen by by so many millions of people who who cannot necessarily uh, deal with it, and then it goes in all kinds of ways. And it's because in in this case again, it was a very radical uh, political movie. It came uh, to the the desk of heads of state of the film of, of Tanzania, where I shot the film. They were running a hate campaign. They were I got death threats. The uh, the Ukrainian mafia was. Uh, on my on my neck, I had uh, to to spend three years in on, on, in court to fight uh, you know defamation uh, of any uh, of terrible. I mean, I had a terrible life to be uh, to be honest because the movie left its its uh, its place you know because uh, because those people uh, saw it you know in in in, uh, in Africa the head of state saw it as an as an intellectual act of terrorism against the, the good good image of their own their own country. Um, uh, the import export lobby of, of uh, the billion dollar business of, of, of fish of this stupid fish from Lake Victoria which is kind of the protagonist of my film Nile Perch <clears throat> uh, was suddenly not anymore important it imported in Europe I mean not because of my movie but because it was nominated for an Oscar and then it just blew you know its its uh, its limits so what should I say I was happy <clears throat> that that many people saw saw a film, but but millions of people probably misunderstood it and 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 were seeing it with the prism of of uh, of, of some kind of right wing hate uh, uh, propaganda, and then said, okay, yeah, that's a film against against Tanzania. That's a film against uh, against uh, global business. It's against humanitarian aid, whatever. You know, it, it was it was not against any any. So, so what, what should I say? I, I mean, um, I, I get an audience, uh, but sometimes uh, more than I wished for, and then and people that uh, I, I wasn't ready to kind of engage with. I think that's very well said. Yeah. <laughs> um, if no, I'm, it's it's I'm audience, ready. ultimately, and and even if it goes out to wider people, you know, I mean, ugh, that's, that's a really interesting story. Yeah. Um, but now, you. can I just wrap up for, for Epicentro? Uh, Epicentro is my latest film. I, I was living in, in Cuba for three years. <clears throat> I'm not sure if this hat is from Cuba. I just put it on my head because I'm full of plaster. I was in a construction site. Um, and it is, it is the first film I made uh, kind of about America, about the United States, and that's of course a very delicate thing because if you if you are not from the United States, and if you're hitting a, a nerve um, of a society that's already struggling with its own, you know, narrative uh, in, a, in a very 
very difficult way. Um, <clears throat> and it can be difficult, but I, but I must say, I mean, the film was world premiered in Sundance. It is a radically political film. It's not, it's not a film that is, is uh, you know, romanticizing the Cuban revolution at all, even though I have a Cuban flag here. Um, uh, but it's shot in Cuba because that's where the United States kind of defined itself as an empire when, when uh, the US's main was attacked by what the US said, the Spanish <clears throat> empire in, in 1898. So it was, so I, I didn't know what's gonna happen. I, I brought the film to, to uh, Sundance and I was just, uh, I was just hoping of course that it's going to be read in an intelligent way. And it was because in Sundance, there's like a thousands of highly educated and visually educated people. And, and I got the, the grand jury award in Sundance and, and I could have just, they could have chased me out of, out of, uh, of America too, you know? So I wasn't sure it was gonna, what's gonna happen. So I was, I was received great, you know, I was, I'm, I was very happy. And as we all know, just after that event, um, I made a New York premiere and then, you know, uh, in March and last year, and then the world shut down, you know, that's, that was, and from now on, we are only two dimensional humans, or we look like humans, but we're just a screen, you know. So, I don't know if you're, are you guys real? Or are you, are you alive? Are you there? No, <laughs> not real. Not really. Or maybe you're pre-recorded clones or something. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you're not a robot, you know, sorry. I'm a clone. Not a yeah, that's a yeah, great. Yeah. You look good. You look. You look like a handsome, handsome boy. <laughs> so yeah. So that's uh, So I. That's what I can say now. But but also I. I don't have like a massive, massive audience. You know, I have. Uh, it's like there's there's people who know all my films and read all the, all the articles, but it's still in. It's still a. It's still not a wide audience. You know. It's well, not. yeah. I mean, for documentary filmmakers, it's always, I think, a continuous struggle. When yeah. have you, when when has one ever really made it? Unless you film penguins. If you film penguins, exactly, you know. then yeah. <clears throat> a lifetime of success. Um, I guess that leads me into the next question about everything being virtual now. I know with um, with this festival and your experience at Ilava, it was an all online event um, at the last minute. It sounds like kind of or. Uh, fairly late in the process, they decided to do everything virtually. So can you guys talk about your experience um, with that, how it differed from previous festival experiences you've had? I know as an organizer this last year, I enjoyed, people didn't have to pay exorbitant amounts to travel to Park City um, and break their banks. And we were able to include programmers and filmmakers from all around the world for different events. And I thought that was a really nice perk. But then again, you miss these moments of bumping into a random person in a hallway, finding out they're one of the coolest people you've ever met, and then they become your lifelong collaborator. Like those things aren't happening now, but... So just talk a little bit um, about your experience with this and any pros and cons you see happening. I'm trying to stay positive about it, um, but maybe you guys have a different spin. <laughs> um, Adam, do you wanna go ahead and begin? Okay, I'll be short because once we had an um, international premiere in Rotterdam with this film, uh, when I was approaching the belt of uh, recollecting my baggage, there was a uh, footage of the Chinese uh, hospital building up in 10 days uh, to save the uh, world from COVID. And I was watching it on the screen at that time. And uh, I said, okay, something huge coming from the news channel that I see every day some some disasters and here I go I, I collect my back in the festival I'm safe I go to festival and I'm watching this hospital being being built in China and here we go to two weeks after we've been not traveling or two months after so we were lucky like I'm I need to say that I, we were lucky that we had some premiere so uh, we didn't have a Czech premiere yet in the cinema, which is maybe the most uh, painful <clears throat> for every filmmaker that you cannot show film to your friends or to to people who allies with your friends and uh, it doesn't create um, the needed atmosphere for enjoying the movie itself. 
But in the other hand, you still have the film prizes around and the film critics showing up, uh, talking. And then you find yourself in the situation that you are being judged in a way of making some film, but no audience. And that's the very strange feeling, you know, like I can understand very well that uh, everything can go worldwide, uh, online and stuff like that. I think there is the future of that. And then we as a documentary filmmakers need to need to face it as a reality. There is no better choice for us to to spread the films around the world than to hanging uh, hang it on um, Internet. But still there is missing one <clears throat> one particle which is the audience that also hubert was uh, saying that you get the audience that you don't want and in the other hand you have the experience that you never had before so you need to deal with those things and uh, you need to find yourself in good balance of that finding yourself in the living room uh, experiencing experience seeing it uh, in the way that you normally don't do. You know, you don't get drunk in front of the kids. You don't uh, speak to filmmakers in front of the kids. I'm now in the office and not in, in my home. And that's all going on, you know, and once the film is personal, it comes into the story. So all of the films that I make, that I make are kind of personal. So I'm used to a one-to-one -one meeting with every spectator I'm getting and no matter if it's online or, or uh, if it's real, because it's always one-to-one. -one. If you have some question from the audience, it's one-to-one. It's -one. And our character from our movie, Jan Schwankmeier, who is maybe most uh, famous around the, uh, around the world, but not in our home country, which is the fact. <clears throat> He's saying one very good film thing in, in the film as well, like one sentence. And he's saying like, you cannot uh, see the real like complex audience. It never, it never comes like it's not, not existing. He is actually having fight with his producer who is producing his films over 30 years. And uh, the producer wants him to make something special that the audience will enjoy. And he's answering him the sentence, but there is no like common audience. You cannot, you cannot say there is a common audience. It's always Mr. Vondracek or Mr. somebody else who, who percepts the film and all the perception of the film is great and individual. So I think this time is allowing us to, to go deeper into this and uh, to find your audience uh, most properly and and that's the most precise tool to to measure your audience so i'm very curious about that despite uh, a lot of anger and 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 anxious feelings that i have uh, since the film is not in cinema but i think this is gone already this feeling is gone that's it it's not going to be the same. I mean, and this leads into my next question, which I'll just kind of weave in now since that's where this is heading anyway. I, I noticed in watching all three of these films, there's a there's a lot of there's a few common themes that I noticed, but the one that really resonated with me the most are these themes of kind of time and metamorphosis that come up in each of these films. And I love that scene that you're referencing with the director and the producer that's so classic where the producer's like, we need to appeal to a wide audience, like water it down. And the director's like, no. <laughs> I mean, that's just the classic conflict between director producer relationships. Um, and then also this idea that, um, you know, artists will be true to their vision. And then when a spectator or viewer, you know, picks it up, then meaning is always gonna change too in those relationships. Every person interacting with art forms kind of an alchemical relationship um, and it'll always be different. You know, each spectator will kind of view things differently. I think that's really interesting. Um, but as we're dealing now in these times of, you know, COVID hit, we all had to very rapidly and creatively adjust to a new way of life. It just happened kind of spontaneously and very quickly. Let's all get on Zoom. Let's figure this out. Let's come up with these creative solutions to keep continue working and creating art. 
Um, and now we're facing vaccine rollouts and what is this new normal going to look like? It's probably not gonna look like in-person festivals again right away or you know, 500 seat theaters, unfortunately, but what, what does it look like? And those kinds of questions and ideas kept coming up for me in each of these films because I feel like each one is kind of dealing with themes of time and metamorphosis that feels really relevant right now. So that kind of weaves into the same question that I'm asking, I guess, about um, transitioning, transitioning now to online festivals and what this new normal looks like. Um, but Adam, you were already drawing in like themes from your film. So I'm just gonna throw that out there now too as something mm -hmm. I've been thinking a lot about. Um, Okay, so Pedro, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience with online, what you see the future looking like? How well, do we keep adjusting to all these constant changes <laughs> now? And uh, Yes, uh, as a producer, I would like to first comment on the scene from Adam's film. I think producers uh, that want filmmakers to do the films differently so they reach more audiences are just being lazy because they don't want to do their, their part of the job, which would be like to take the film to th those audiences and they want the, an easier way. Um, so I, I honestly don't believe in, in changing the films. Of course, we have uh, creative ideas about how films should be, but the criteria being uh, make it easier for the audience doesn't make sense to me. And I think it's really a, a misunderstanding that producers uh, adopt this role for themselves as people who want the films to be more easier or si more simple. Um, that's like an easy way out, but it's not going to work either. So I think really the, the, the crucial thing is how we promote the films, honestly. Um, about the festivals uh, and the, the pandemic and the virtual world, I'm honestly not nostalgic at all from the world we had in 2019. Um, I'm nostalgic about the world I've never seen where there were many film theaters. I, I've heard about this world. I've never seen it. Um, I have to admit that, well, if, if I think about this, I, most films that are my favorite films of, of all time, the classics, all the films I really love, I would say 90% of them, I watch them on a computer or on a TV um, because they're old films, they're not being screened or they're contemporary films, but I've seen them through links or things like that. Not that I want to, I would love to watch them on the big screen, but in 2019, the reality was already that I was watching things on DVDs, if, well, 10 years ago on DVDs and on TV, well, the, the film that changed my life when I was 14 years old, I watched it on TV. It was, it's a Manuel de Oliveira. It's like an old Portuguese filmmaker um, for the people who don't know him. It's kind of demanding cinema. It was, luckily I caught it on TV and Which changed film? my life. Uh, the Abraham's Valley. Do you know which one it is from 80? You make a, a comedy debut. The, yeah. The that's him, yeah. Yeah, that, that's amazing. It's beautiful, yeah, yeah. That's well, beautiful. Comedia de Deus, I, you, you mean uh, another Portuguese filmmaker, um, João César Monteiro, I think, which is amazing, yes. It's for the same generation. Yeah. Um, so this to say that I wish we would change things from the way they are now, but many times in these conversations, I see people, uh, mixing the, these two things, the, the pandemic and the virtual world. And it's like, it, it's like this happened in the eighties. If it had happened in the eighties, the contrast would have been huge, but things were already preparing to be this way. I, I honestly don't like to go to film festivals and have to watch five films a day so that I can watch them. Otherwise, I will never have a chance again to watch them on the video. You get the links, right? I mean, exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I see them on some stream, uh, streaming uh, platform or I download them. And that's how people are watching many films today in torrents. And 
often I have friends asking me, I tell this many times because it's my, it's true, films, uh, people who are not from the film scene, they ask me how can, how can they watch uh, a certain film because they cannot find it online and in the end they, they download it and they cannot find it anywhere. But the, the, my point being people want to watch them. People are asking me because I'm supposed to know how they are watched. I don't know more than any, anyone else. So it's great that festivals give attention and highlight the good films. And I hope this work of programming continues to be made and it becomes even more relevant that programmers distinguish which films and make sense to certain audiences. Like I was saying, the, the, the role of the producer as uh, someone who, who does when the film is finished also takes it somewhere, then there's the programmers, the distributors, all this. I hope that the, the role of these people keeps on uh, developing and becoming more important, but I, I don't think it was <coughs> good uh, before the, the, the virus came. Uh, so I just <coughs> wish we can maybe have film theaters again. That, that's, that doesn't depend on COVID, uh, that depends on gentrification of cities. Uh, the economic system, uh, I think that's what it depends on. Uh, so sometimes it's a bit of a, is, is a misleading to, 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 to attribute all the problems to the, the pandemic. That's at least how, how I feel it. And, and let me just use the opportunity to tell Hubert that I never again ate a Nile Perch after watching your film. So I think that's uh, very important that you did that. Uh, I hope I'm the right audience that you wanted to, to have. No, it's, it's true. I watched it on Doc Lisboa in Lisbon while well, the year it was there um, by chance. So that's a good thing of festivals uh, that we see things by chance and we discover things. But the model of these 10 days running around, uh, I, I don't think it's the... I, I wish there were festivals all year long. Like we could just go... I think that's called <coughs> film theaters. <laughs> with good programming, I, I would like that. Yeah, I wish we'd met. I wasn't there when they started. Oh, damn it. Yeah. But um, now, now we know each other. It's good. Now we do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I see you some, somewhere with a beer. Um, yes, it would be great. I, should, I, uh, should I say a few things to this uh, yes, team? Please, go ahead, that's perfect. <clears throat> uh, well, it, it kind of joins the, uh, the, the theme of my movie, Epicentro. Uh, it is precisely about cinema about moving images. And the, the irony is that, uh, you know, film existed already when cinema was invented. Because, uh, because Thomas Edison invented essentially a little box uh, where you could see a film individually, like you look into a hole and you see moving images, which is very American. It's uh, individualism, this I, me, I, me and myself see a movie. <clears throat> that was before the Lumiere brothers in, in Paris, where I'm now, uh, invented the, the idea that you could actually throw it on the wall and share the experience and be on a journey together and have people shouting and standing up when the train comes at the same time and all these <clears throat> amazing things that cinema does to, our, to us. The common journey, the, 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 the common experience. Um, and that that is magical and it's, it is never going to go away. Uh, um, and of course we are nostalgic now because uh, we, I mean, I was in film school and I went to see Jarmers and Wenders and Aki Kawasmeki's movies like, like going to church, you know, it's like, it was like Kawasmeki made a new film. So we all went like, like to, to a holy growl or something. Um, <clears throat> and that was beautiful. And we were a group and we were hanging out afterwards and, and getting drunk and talking about the movie all night, etc. So the common experience is important, but, but that is also, we shouldn't forget, um, <clears throat> that was invented in Europe, but it was, it was in 1898, which is actually, that is the story of, of Epicentro. Uh, three years after the Lumiere brother invented the idea that you could collectively see moving images, uh, the United States uh, and Edison and his, his teams uh, understood that, that this is the technology of, of the moment and this is the technology can literally change the world. And it, it, it did in such a, a, a crazy way that, that in the theory, in the theory I was developing in epicenter is that 
<clears throat> the birth of the moving images and the birth of the United States as an empire was coinciding. And it's not a coincidence. It was like that was the trigger that the United States could see itself and represent itself with this amazing power that's called soft power. And then with this amazing invention that is kind of Hollywood that, that projects literally uh, a, a way of, of a narrative into the, into the whole planet. And, and, and we shouldn't forget that that very invention that the United States had in 1898 and using cinema as propaganda to, to rule, to, to convey its own propaganda against the Spanish evil empire at, at that state. I mean, that's what this, the US position was. Uh, that, that formula was, was also, uh, you know, bringing down the world kind of. That was, that was Stalin's biggest tool and Hitler's and Goebbels and, uh, and there's no dictator on the planet who didn't understand that TV and, and cinema is the, the thing to, to kind of, uh, you know, have in hands, you know? Um, and so, so now, and now a hundred years later, we, we kind of come back to the individual form. It's like, I'm alone with my computer watching, <laughs> watching Casablanca in my bed, you know? So that's the kind of the original form, you know, it's like, that's, that was Edison before cinema was even invented. And it's American again, you know? So Europeans are always a bit, a bit slower, you know? Uh, it's, and it's interesting that, that, that all these crazy things like now the internet, of course, uh, uh, come from not only from the US, but mostly from the, from the West Coast, you know? And Hollywood, and and, and I'm, I'm even a member of this the academy, which is which is like uh, the, the, the factory of uh, the dream uh, factory, and the uh, you know it's 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 soft power. It's, it's it's it is producing. It makes people in 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 Afghanistan want to use a, a surfboard, you know, or a skateboard, you know. And that's perceived as, as progress and amazing because they get to see these pictures and, and it's fine, you know, but it's like, uh, it's ironic, you know, that we are like, it's kind of in a, going in a, in a, in a loop, you know, we're yeah. back to the, we're back to the, to, to the beginning. And yeah, the next step, and the next step, I mean, I mean, of course, in, in every, every change of technology, when, when, you know, cinema came up, uh, people said radio would disappear. And when, you know, when photography, was invented, people said nobody's gonna paint anymore because photography is so much better. Of course, it, it co coexists, you know? Mm -hmm. So cinema will, will coexist, um, um, but, um, but in a different way, it's gonna be less, but, but I, I, hope, I hope very much that film festivals will keep existing. And even though it, it goes along with, you know, staying up all night and, and drinking too much uh, alcohol for a lot of people etc but it still is an experience of, of 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 an incredible intensity you know to to especially this kind of hub of, of the supernova of uh, of thinking and, and and highly highly uh, intelligent people that kind of kind of thrown into a into a into a you know big party you know, which is which is which is extraordinary and i miss it of course you know. yeah it's interesting too this idea of analyzing our nostalgia um and really thinking about what we're nostalgic for and how far back the nostalgia goes and how real it is um but it's gonna be it's gonna be i mean in his love i was like in, all of my films were in his love I, I never had time to come but and, and this year last year i was ready to go and it online you know so but i i can't wait to to go once you know if i'm Travel invited. again will be nice for sure um okay we have some audience questions so i'm going to ask the first one in the chat that i see here um your films hold a lot of cultural specificity have you noticed that the audience reactions differ from one country to another not just in the u.s versus europe but maybe even within different parts of europe or other parts of the world? Or is it that the kind of audience that will watch indie documentaries are more alike than they are different regardless of where they are in the world? It comes back, I think, to this theme of globalization that we kind of keep talking about within art house cinema. Maybe there's something there. Uh, who's, who's? 
Uh, we can start with Adam again. Hey, <clears throat> like in the reaction to this uh, question and all what was said before, I think that we are mostly creating the cans of something that can be preserved for the for the later use, which is great great uh, thing for for or great thing of cinema that we we really if if the audience doesn't meet the film, we need to wait for another audience. And it means also time-wise, it also means the, the, the space-wise. And uh, as, the, as, the, as the question was asking, I think it's the right thing because Europe is so complicated that we don't understand each other very well uh, all around. And that's, it's so unique <clears throat> and I like it. I like that my film resonates somewhere in Romania differently than in Poland and we are still speaking about Eastern uh, Eastern like Europe then the West is different and how, how we see each other is different and we are living in such a short uh, memory uh, together that uh, the, the films are just showing up the first layer and if we do these films with a certain uh, knowledge about uh, what we are dealing with it's very necessary to to just be calm and uh, to wait for the audience later on and i think this like i'm from the family of uh, the theater makers which are dealing with uh, such a uh, problematic things even now in covid and uh, in normal age as well they sometimes al always miss the audience mm. and this is the great uh, honor to cinematography that this is not happening. There are just too many films and we need the festivals to be promoted. As uh, Pedro said also, like we need the promotion. And if people knows about the film and if uh, then, then it's, it, it's uh, st storage somewhere, doesn't matter, but some, somebody needs to know the title and then pick it up 20 years ago, or uh, sorry, 20, 20 years later. And I think this is working and this makes me you know, feel good. And as always, I will just tell you something from the movie that is screened now, The Alchemical Furnace, where Jan Schwankmeier was um, not possible to, uh, he was not allowed to shoot for the period of eight years in his life. Certainly the, the age of his greatest uh, like development, like he was uh, at around 50, 40, 50 years old, and he was not allowed to make films anymore for eight years. So he, he brought himself into something totally different to, to the tactile uh, studies of, of art uh, creation that he was doing at that time. And he totally forgot about moving images and he started to, to touch the, <clears throat> the material uh, to make a keramics which later on appeared in, in his following work in filmmaking. And he said that it, he was totally happy. Like he was not having any trouble with that because he just like brought something else in, into his hands and tried to reveal some sense of it, the human, which is not the, <clears throat> just the sight, which brings you into very com like commercial way of thinking because it's, uh, the, the sight is like, uh, distorted by 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 the overuse and so the touch is maybe the sense that will bring the same uh, like essence so that was it and he was not doubting this and he came back into filmmaking and suddenly his later films are full of like touch uh, feelings that he brought from before so and he was also saying that the film is can the shit is then is there it's, it's sealed and it sells great if it's sealed, you know, like it needs to be just sealed and looking well in the shelf and that's, that's how, it should, how it should be. So we need to just find a way how to promote ourselves as a sealed uh, film can in front of you. When you approach the, the regal, there should be your film written. And that's, that's the way how, how, how to learn to see that. That's, that's my question. <laughs>
Hey, Joe, do you have an answer for that question? Sure. Well, it's a very interesting question, actually. Uh, so thank you for it. Um, art really is a mystery because I'm, I'm a bit obsessed about these different cultural differences, uh, especially in this globalized world. And I think, uh, well, at least what has happened to me most of the times is that we make a film, we think it is a certain thing, and especially when it, we show it to people who are from a different country, I wouldn't even say like from the other part of the world, just like a different culture, or even sometimes inside the same country, we, we through this uh, collision between the film and the audience, we, we discover the, what we actually have done because, and we discover how we are. And, and I, I'm thinking about very precise things here. In several films I produced, the documentaries especially, I've been faced with uh, questions by people from other cultures, especially the Anglo-Saxon world about family that really surprised me a lot. And uh, that allowed me to discover the, this cultural difference between, let's say, a more Latin approach and or Southern European approach and the, and the more Anglo-Saxon world. We, we were coming out of a screening at a festival, so I'm contradicting myself here. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the, it was a Dutch woman, she, she said, um, oh, the, the films generally have to do with families in Portugal. I realized, I didn't even realize that all the films I had produced or most of them had the family as a, a very crucial part of it. And so we were talking about families and, and she said something and I commented that my family, blah, blah, blah. And then I said something about my grandparents and something. And then the, this other Portuguese person was present and also talked about her family. And suddenly she, this Dutch woman said, how come you know so much about your families? And this because of the film. Uh, and we thought it was perfectly natural that we knew the lives of our grandparents and even before them. And she said, no, I don't think in the Netherlands people know about so much about their families. And this, this stuck with me. And then because the, these two films, the one I have in this program, the, the Ghosts, and the, this other one I produced uh, last year as well, they're both about families. I've been paying attention. And it's really funny how apparently in Portugal we have a model and a role for family. And I'm not talking about like heteronormative families. It's not, it's, these families in our film are very, in our both films are very strange. But apparently uh, we live the idea of family in a different way. I have a friend from New York who watched the, the Metamorphosis of Birds the other day. And he told me, oh, wow, uh, like in Portugal, uh, grandparents and grandchildren, they talk in this way. It never occurred to me, you know, and, and in, a, in a time where we think everything is globalized and everything is the same, um, it is at a certain level, things have become very normalized, but these kind of cultural deeper roots, uh, like you were talking before about France uh, versus the US, for instance, as for the, the theater or the little box, these things persist. So when yes for sure when we show films around uh we i've been realizing that they're they're experienced in very different ways uh according to where we we show them and especially i i discover more about ourselves uh, which is funny uh, we, we we think we're showing something to other people but what they give back to us really is is more enlightening to us we don't really know what we've done most of the times i think that's right. <clears throat> Great. Um, uh, well, the, I mean, the world has developed um, uh, uh, thousands of languages um, around the world, uh, or tens of thousands, um, and only one is is truly universal. That is the, that, that is cinema. That is that is the universal language. So if Charlie Chaplin uh, falls on a banana skin, but I mean, almost anywhere in the world can be can be read and understood. <clears throat> um, when uh, I mean, 
what is even more universal, of course, is when cinema does not have language. Uh, because that was the case of Chaplin. And it became when, when sound and cinema was kind of, when sound was invented or added to the moving images, it kind of became more specific and, and lost its universal, universal you know, thing in, in a way. Um, my experience is that, is that <clears throat> what, is, what is most common and most uh, like what, what passes everywhere and then transgresses every culture is, 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 is image without words, of course, and is, is tragedy. You know? So tragedy can, can be uh, understood. You know, if you, you see a, a child in Congo uh, crying on its, on its mother's body, everyone can understand that. Uh, when somebody tells a joke in Czechoslovakia or Czech, Czech Republic, I'm sorry, it's really a bad thing to say. Uh, it's the same. Uh, uh, then it, it's very specific because people in Czech Republic laugh specific about specific things with different sets of you know associations, cultural backgrounds, etc. <clears throat> so, so tragedy is more universal. Um, um, than than anything else that is can be represented. Uh, so, um, in in a in a in a weird way, I live in France um, and uh, I make mostly documentaries. And there is a school of of making documentaries in France, which is uh, which has a formula, which is uh, which is an academic formula, which is a uh, thesis, antithesis, uh, synthesis, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis um, and I, I don't I, I don't care about this concept so I never I never thought about it I don't want to you know, adhere to it I, it doesn't occur to me it, I find it boring and stupid so I, so I don't I don't do it so a lot of people in in in, in, in certain uh, you know circles in my own town in Paris uh, get lost because like how did you construct this film and why didn't you explain better and why didn't you at the end make kind of a conclusion and I said like okay you, you, you make your conclusion that's like you're you're the audience you're you're not I mean I have to count on your intelligence not, not I don't want to feed your brain like like a, like a newborn baby you know um so so I I I, I encounter these kind of these kind of uh, boundaries, but I also <clears throat> uh, encounter a lot of uh, situations where, you know, in, in epicenter, there's a scene where, 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 you know, ten year old kids just start to crazily dance on the rooftop, which has happened to be my own my, my own place uh, where I lived and worked. And uh, my friend Una Chaplin is playing this little uh, little. Uh, guitar and singing and it's just like there's nothing to not understand like everyone in the world goes like oh my god this is just this is this is literally paradise um and one of the kids says it says it i'm it just screams i'm in paradise <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you probably haven't seen this you said you saw the film three quarters right anyway um, I thought that, uh, if I can say, I what? thought that she's uh, amazed by the person who was like having this uh, this rooftop that asked her to to be to be actress and to give her a little bit more of uh, yeah. yeah that's my that's my my place. And Una is Una is the actress. Ah, yeah. In real life, she's an actress. But anyway, so so sometimes it's despite despite of us, it transgresses anything. You know, tragedy, joy, uh, and sometimes uh, you know it's 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 not. Uh, sometimes it has just has to stay in its own boundaries. You know, and there's just films for intellectuals, and that just cannot be read outside of certain you know certain uh, areas of where the codes are shared, so to say. Um, and, and that's uh, the humor, sorry, but sorry to say, but maybe the humor is the thing that makes it more complicated, right? Because that's what I, that's what I said. 
That's what more I said. Than tragedy. Mm -hmm. I said tragedy is more universal than humor, and humor but is. That's pity, you know. Like that's that's a real pity that the tragedy can be something more universal. Well, it's it's a fact. It's like if somebody dies or or is killed, you know, by a madman, everyone can understand that that is a tragedy and can read it. You know, if somebody tells a joke in Thailand, not everyone is laughing. You know, humor within cultural differences is much harder. Yeah, but maybe in a, more specific than tragedy. It's a, that's what in, I want. In, in a future where everyone will be very happy, maybe they won't have the concept of tragedy and they'll be very right. confused about uh, mm -hmm. what we're talking about. <laughs> we're not there, right. but you're, you're right. Actually, like, actually, yes, yes. I was saying in Portugal is, 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 is really good doing it well, that the tragedy and the humor comes together in Joao Cesar Monteiro, for example. Well, well, tragedy for us, and again, back to the cultural differences and specificities, we, tragedy, I would not say tragedy in the same sense that you were talking about before, but well, the sadness and this nostalgia, it's like a sport here. Uh, yeah. So we, we're very used to it, so it becomes kind of funny. But again, it's a very specific, specific thing. It, uh, but surprisingly, when it goes abroad, uh, people get it. Uh, and 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 this is the thing that has amazed me the most: is things that I really thought would not be shared or shareable. People understand them. The, the reaction is, oh, I had never thought about that before. But it, it, often it, it is not, I don't get it. it. And that's, I didn't expect that. I expect it to be, I don't understand. Um, but it is not. It's people are, are sometimes like I am amazed at things we didn't know. But, but I, I, I agree with what you guys said before as well. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Why, why is in Portugal the uh, Saudade a national cult? Well, maybe. Why, the, why, why not in, in other countries? I mean, what, what does, is that the, the end of the empire? Or, or is it... Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, uh, well, I, it would need maybe a, a history class, but uh, the fast answer, my theory is that, yes, it's a bit like Russia, a uh, big empire collapsed, uh, but with the fact that we are very small. We have been in a crisis since the 1700s, uh, basically. There was never like a, a, a happy times or like a, a consistently uh, economically stable moment. So I think people got used to it. Um, and we don't know any other thing that that's what we know. Um, so people are very like a bit sad, but it becomes something else. It, it's like longing for um, the things you didn't, you never had actually. But then, if you if you lose that, if you're suddenly happy, you don't know how to deal with it. So that's when you really become sad. <laughs> so we keep on the this borderline. And again, you're right. It's tragedy. Everyone understands it. Everyone understands what I'm saying. But still, I think we understand what is shared. So if in a very future uh, from now, we, we have a society that maybe is not as, uh, doesn't have the same problems we have today. Uh, I, I'm talking about a different civilization, but just like to, to theoretically, just thinking about the pot potentiality of human beings, we would not have to be to, in this tragedy as, as the, the shared element. I, I believe we could be, we could share other things. The example you gave about Chaplin and the banana, uh, well, you only understand it if you know what a banana is. Um, I agree with you, but at the same time, um, there's, you, you need, we need to share something. Uh, maybe we can share other things, happiness or other cultural grid. I don't know. Yeah. So I agree with, I think what you're saying here is interesting too. In the beginning, you were mentioning um, being pleasantly surprised when you engage people um, versus spoon feeding what you want people to be thinking. Um, my experience too has been that spectators generally will rise to the occasion and, and make that effort. Um, and then to wrap this up too, I just want to say about at the Centro, one thing that really struck me is the joyousness of that scene on the roof. Um, 
versus that brief moment with the photographer who, is he American? And he's, and he says, uh, somebody asked him for money, but he, it's a privilege for them to be photographed by him. Is he, <laughs> that moment stood in such stark contrast to the rest of the film for me, because there's so many moments between you and the subjects that are so symbiotic, it feels like, and for this guy to be saying, um, what he's saying. Is he American? Was that an American accent? I guess he's I was just... American. He's from New York. He says that. And he says, Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. He's so, uh, I mean, why the scene is so, so crazy is it's not that he says like he's, he's proud of himself. He's like, like these little Cubans should be happy that I take pictures of them. They should be honored, you know. But yeah. he, he says, that why, why it probably st stuck into your, in, in your soul is that. At the same time, he has this kind of pseudo humanitarian discourse, you know, oh, they're they are poor, we should help them. Oh my, oh, what, what well, you know, they're poor, but uh, they, they don't even know they're poor. Uh, this whole, like this whole bullshit, you know, it's like, it's like this, savior this or good, something. The good, the good people discourse, you know? Mm -hmm. So in, in, inside of almost, almost the same phrase, it's like, they should be honored that I take a picture of them. You know? So it's like, he's the extractionist in person and in action, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I was just uh, so happy to, to film the scene and it was so sad also because I was essentially uh, an, an ethnographer, ethnographic filmmaker at that, that moment and I was following a human being interacting with people from a very different culture and in a very, uh, you know, disturbing way. But it's disturbing also because we know these kind of stories. We know that the Europeans uh, went to Africa and threw, you know, candies into crowds of cheap uh, children. You know, um, that we, we know this narrative, and it's just so painful and so and it's so dark. <laughs> it's a really powerful moment. And uh, and uh, yeah, that's why it sucked to you. But but I know there's there's a lot of scenes in Epicenter who, who have a similar tone. Mm -hmm. that are kind of on the surface, you know, nice, and, and, but observational, somehow, you know, dark. It's like, it's like the, the, this beautiful old man who's 90 years old, he's pitch dark and, uh, and he, and he talks about the sugar factory and that Coca-Cola used to have, get his sugar from here. And he, he insists like seven times that it's white sugar, white, white sugar, how great is white sugar. And that he's, He's of obviously an, an off, off, uh, offspring of uh, of slaves who who died for for this, you know, white sugar. So, so there's a lot of a lot of dark things in, in the film, but it's it is compared to my other films in Africa, it's a it's a joy, very joyful. It's a joyous film, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, most people haven't seen my first film in Africa. It's called Kisangani Diary. I mean, no one kind of no one I know in this world has uh, everyone who sees this film it's shot in 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 the midst of a genocide in the Congo and it obviously cost almost my my life and my my mental kind of equilibrium and there's uh, but there compared to that Darwin's nightmare is a, it's a musical uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, Comedy musical, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joyful way. But um, so, so uh, for some reason, I, I keep making very political films, but they become more and more joyful and funny in a way. So, yeah, but, personal, maybe. I'm very happy about that. So because I couldn't, I, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't keep going. I couldn't. I mean, there's no way I could go and. I, them another genocide in this world. That's a, that's a good Actually, that leads in very nicely to the last question um, mm. from the group chat too, and a typical last Q and A question. Um, what are you guys working on now, if not genocide? Uh, what are your next projects? Um, and back to this theme throughout, we've been talking about how have you been impacted by COVID? Are all of your talking head interviews taking place over Zoom? What challenges are you facing, um, et cetera? Can uh, Adam go ahead and talk about maybe what you're working on now? 
Yeah, so working on now is a very difficult question because uh, it can be one year, two years, five years of work. So for the moment, I'm working on my own projects, which is like more personal stuff. Uh, I'm trying to find a way about differences between West and East of Europe. And as I have an Italian wife and we live in Eastern Europe, I'm like collecting the data for capture like how how different we are how how the the world is different in the united europe and how we are uh, dealing with that so this is true personal story driven film which i would like not to be so much personal so this is the first 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 project about the differences and hopefully interesting also for US audience in a way because uh, it's dealing with the same stuff. I think that the world is still divided and we are still not the generation that can deal perfectly with uh, certain things. And another things are like I'm doing myself cinematography for the documentary. So I'm, I'm shooting the, the France films and then, uh, then I'm I'm searching for the materials of, of another like uh, documentary about the music composer Karel Ancero, who was like leader of uh, Czech Philharmonic at the at the at the very age of uh, 50s 60s when the Czech Philharmonic peaked the the, the top of uh, worldwide uh, yeah. fame, and he he left to Toronto to make make uh, his career over in, uh, abroad so this is the story that I this is leading me to find a way how to how to create a movie about it and that's the question that I, I don't want to make it as a classical doc portrait documentary I would like to find a way how to make it in, in the film well there are many projects but I think we never know what will come tomorrow and uh, I'm open to, to whatever kind of continuation. But I think this takes time. So five years, I will say the same answer to this question, I think. Sometimes it's watering a couple seeds until you can see which one grows at what rate, et cetera. You know, that kind of thing too. Um, Pedro, what are you working on now? Well, it was just announced today uh, that the film we're finishing is going to premiere at the Vision du Réel Film Festival in the competition of the medium length films. Um, and it, it, we're just finishing the post production. And again, it's a film that I realize now that while I choose to produce films that I like instinctively, and it seems that there's after some films there's a pattern and there's uh, common themes on, on on between them and in this case like we were talking about uh, this universality of cinema but also how european documentary is perceived in the in the us uh, sometimes we 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 are watching things from very far away uh, well in america people looking to Europe and, and very different cultures. But in this film, it's funny because it, we, we shot just 30 minutes or well, one hour from where I live, where we live in Lisbon into the countryside. And we get a completely different reality. Uh, it's not just about going to the countryside, it's about going to well, old villages. It's a, it's a region with a very particular history. It, it was, uh, it's a very political region because it's it was well most of the society there were peasants for centuries and in the 20th century well portugal had uh, a dictatorship uh, a far right fascist dictatorship and then we had a revolution in the in 74 and at the time uh, this region has always been very left wing so to say uh, well far left and uh, it, this comes from the fact that it was peasants mostly, and then they organized and there was communities. It's not like that anymore, but all this to say, it's such a rich world. Uh, it, it has its own musical genre um, that is completely, it's beautiful. 
um, it, people live with a different connection to the land because this is a very remote, like it's not a mountain, but sort of a mountain range um, that even though it's just one hour for here, it becomes very isolated to go from one village to the other. And just because of this geography, uh, people were given land because otherwise nobody would live there. And it's kind of this alternative world <laughs> that was preserved there. Um, and it's just one hour from here. So I think cinema allows also for this. So when, when I hear people say, let's make it easier so that people understand it, let's make it more accessible or let's shape it in a certain way. I really don't think, I understand it of course, but I, I really think that cinema can give us what we actually don't understand uh, and what we don't know. And maybe in the, last century of cinema, we were going in this direction of uh, going really far away, seeing really exotic, exotic things somewhere or discovering the other because there was no globalization. But now that we have this globalization, we can just use cinema to discover what's around the corner. And it's so different. So it's, it was surprising. Uh, the film is going to premiere now in the, in the festival. So I hope it travels and that people can, can watch it. The director is called Monica Martins Nunes. It's a newcomer, uh, a woman filmmaker. So yeah, I'm very happy with that film. That's very exciting and ties in, I think, to this um, Portuguese theme you were mentioning earlier of kind of generational history being in touch with, um, which I think for sure. American, I, I don't, this sounds very foreign to me, but um, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, okay, uh, Hubert, what are you working on now? Um, I mean, I told you earlier that I, I make uh, you know, radical political movies and I was, I was uh, spent years in fighting uh, people who wanted my my skin, Le Mapo. <laughs> uh, so I don't really talk about uh, my films in advance because they that can compromise my work. Um, I, I but I can just tell you a bit, little bit more on why. I mean, I had to, when I when I after Darwin's Nightmare, I had to work uh, literally under a, a pseudonym with a different passport in in Central Africa because it was too dangerous to travel around with my name. So. So I, I can't, I can't tell you. Then you get a pass, you don't have to answer that question. No, the answer is I can't, I have no answer. But I, but, I, but I also want to give you some. Some background on why not, that's. Some, some idea of why, you know, so it's not that I'm like, uh, I don't want to talk about it because I, I actually yeah. do want to talk about it because, um, and I do talk about it in my, in my environment, not publicly, because uh, it is, it is a, highly important thing to formulate ideas in order to hear yourself uh, you know advance those ideas and also to write <clears throat> it's like a lot of people uh, when I go to film schools uh, students say how do you how do you write scenario uh, scripts for a documentary because you never know what's going to happen so you have to write a script you know you have to write scenes that you that might happen that you have seen somewhere before that you might be able to film you have to write and formulate your ideas. And, and that's why I, I like to talk. It's, it's kind of a frustrating thing, thing. I would like to talk about my new film here now, but I don't want to, <clears throat> I don't want this to be on the, on the World Wide Web before I start to work, so. Completely fair. So. I think that's that's interesting too. Is the writing? There's so many interesting threads that have come up today. Yeah, right. I mean, writing is, is important, and it's like, and it's very frustrating because you don't want to write. It's just like, oh, I just go, let me just go to the other side of the world with a camera, and hang out and film. That's not that's not filmmaking. That's holiday making. You know, it's just, it's filmmaking is is having a concept, having ideas, debating the ideas, contradicting them, finding different angles of attack, finding your own motivation, finding out why you, you're driven or not by this and this idea. And, and, and kind of light a fire in your own soul about something, you know, or someone or some, you know, some new place or new, new story. 
what your intentions are in making this film, and, right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and uh, and I mean, it, it is. I mean, there's no there there's no other profession in 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 this world that that gives you so much potential access to 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 humans. No, no, no other no other profession. No. Uh, because you literally enter people's lives in a very intense way as a documentary filmmaker and you're invited in because most humans are, are eager to share their their stories and they are eager to be seen and, and to communicate with with unknown people because they, they will never meet most of the people that are going to see their like I, I'm not, I'm not meeting people watching me now either, you know. But I still communicate into the world because that's what humans do. They, we share, we communicate. So it, it is, it is the most amazing thing to make, to make nonfiction uh, films. I, I don't like the word documentary so much, by the way. Mm -hmm. I agree, yeah, especially now in this time of hybrid, hy hybridity, uh, documentary. Oh, no, I mean, it's also because it's like has this ugly connotation of, of document of protocol uh, <laughs> oh and back to what we were talking about filmmaker subject relationship can be so much more complicated it's uh, not parisians like are, are parisians. Camera and shooting somebody it's not like that like the, the parisians are still uh have are traumatized from from 70 years ago when the when paris was de facto colonized by nazis um and uh, well, a word that keeps fall, kept falling was papire or documente that the Nazis mm -hmm. would say to, to, to the French population, you know. And then you go like shit, you know, document documente. <laughs> so, so it's a it's a trauma. And uh, filling out forms, by the way, is is, is one of my traumas. You know? uh, How can you get film financing in Europe without filling documents? That that's my yeah. life now. It's just making documents it's horrible well you're a producer but it's amazing that you say that because that's that is what most creative people cannot do but you're you're a creative producer as i understand yeah well and I'm, I'm, but the directors have to do it nowadays as well which which i think is a pity uh, yeah I, I mean you have to fill out forms for this talk i mean i have to kind of sign up sign up in uh, at, at the each level website to say you know what i mean i'm sorry it's like it's an example Never but it's days. like i mean i give it i give a master class talk uh in any university in the world which i'm happy to do i get a bit of money but then i have to fill out you know forms and sheets and, and receipts and and i have to sign in and sign out and it's just a fucking nightmare change your password yeah. and blah blah yeah. blah yeah like what and, and uh, date of birth and it's like where where do i live and why do i what the, what the fuck? This like, is a very universal problem. Anyway, the documentary is documentary is, is a problematic term, and it's like it's uh, it, but it's like that's what kind of we agreed on. It's like doc uh, each file is like it's everywhere. But I, I prefer to say cinema and uh, or nonfiction cinema. And it's not like hard success. There is no fiction or nonfiction, but because he makes fiction of everything. But. Uh, <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I like I like where I think the criticism, but but it's it's in my view there is there is a, a clear distinction. It's like uh, if somebody in my film uh, says I'm 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 a pilot from Ukraine, I, I transport guns from Africa from Europe to Africa. It's it's not an actor. It's just his name is Sergei. He really does that, and and he really is a pilot. You know, that's it. There is no no debate about that. And what he says is what he says is 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 the truth. I mean, that I cannot necessarily always prove as as a, as a document because you know, if somebody says in a that's that's a whole interesting debate. You see, if somebody says uh, I am I am from Goma, Congo. I have seven children. Four have died from HIV/AIDS. My wife is also very sick. If that somebody says that on camera. Uh, that can be a lie, you know, because maybe he only had three children and only one died from HIV/AIDS. But nonetheless, it, it is it is a true document, because this person tr truly said that, even if it was a lie. So, because you cannot, 
you cannot be uh, asking this person uh, before releasing the film seven medical documents in in the middle of a civil war to be sure that what you just said or she uh, is true. So that's the whole debate about truth is of course very complicated. And, and not only but, about truth, but oh, sorry to interrupt, but all the things that we can't stage in the fiction, even if we tried to stage them. All right, yeah. Do documentary, whatever word we call it, has that, no? Yeah, but, but it's like nonfiction film is, is, a, is very clearly a, an interpretation of the world. It's like, it's, it's, not, it's not, this is how Africa is. It's like, this is how Hubert sees Africa in that very moment. <clears throat> so it's not staged, but it is it is radically in, interpreted, in, interpreted, um, and that's it. It's called cinema d'auteur. So, uh, there is no, uh, and, and it's it's often mis misunderstood because documentaries in the cine, in the TV world um, for half a century was essentially a, a colonial phenomenon that the BBC went to Bangladesh and said, "This is Bangladesh, a little country." Um, near the Indian Ocean, and then they have a map and a document. It's documenting everything, and, and usually, the, these films, uh, these documentary films, were usually uh, uh, simultaneously saying what they were showing. Also, you know, so it makes you kind of stupid. It's like this is this is a, a baby from Bangladesh. As you see a baby, this is the police coming. Okay, as you see the police coming. <coughs> so, this double overkill in in feeding people's brains means that. It makes you, the audience literally, it takes them for as fools, you know, and it creates fools in a way because you just like, it's like, <coughs> if you keep saying what you see, I keep telling the audience how they should see it, how, how they should feel now. How to feel about it. Mm -hmm. Then, and then when you make, you know, uh, documentaries of, of uh, more, more free interpretation of the world, it's like, where's the explanation? Where's the, where are the figures? Where are the maps? I don't know where we are. <laughs> so that's a, that's a problem. Anyway, I, I prefer non fiction And I'm not going to tell you about the next. Don't. Um, fine. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I really enjoyed speaking with all of you today. Um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, I think we can wrap it up now. This was really fun. I really feel like I learned a lot of things that I'll be pondering. For a while. <laughs> and I really, really enjoyed all of your films. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to meet you, two guys. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Hope to see and, you in uh, the person. Sometime. Let's see. In, let's meet in Islava with a with a beer. Rotterdam yeah. sometime. What? There. Yeah, Rod, I, we were talking about Rotterdam earlier too. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Have a great day. Thank you guys so much. Do we all have so. each other's uh, each other's contacts? Yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah.